Alrighty, um, in this video I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the very general anatomy of a spinal nerve and apply that to the basic physiologic anatomy of a withdrawal reflex. Um, now I'm not going to go over all the pathways that are found within um, within the spinal cord and all that. I'll save that for you know a, a, a video later on. But just having a basic understanding of the layout of the spinal cord and how nerves are structured will definitely be a big step in the right direction to understanding a lot about how we get sensory input to the central nervous system and motor, and motor output out. Okay, so again in this video what I want to do is more or less just talk about the anatomy of uh, the general anatomy of a spinal nerve and then when we then I want to apply that to the basic anatomy of a withdrawal reflex okay the physiologic anatomy now I'm not going to go over all the different types of withdrawal reflexes out there because you know there's the knee-jerk reflex um, you know with you know with the action of the Golgi tendon organ you know there's reciprocal uh, innervation there's the cross extensor reflex Again, I'll save those for later on, but if you just have a basic understanding right now, excuse me, of, again, of just how a reflex works, that'll take you in the right direction to understanding these more specific types. Okay, so on that note, let's get rolling. All right, now when we talk about a spinal nerve, you have to just go back and under, you know, remember the basic bony anatomy of the vertebrae and remember that there are these intervertebral discs found in between the, you know, the bones of the vertebrae, all right? And then the presence of these discs allow, you know, ensures that these bones don't actually contact each other, all right? So then basically in the lateral aspects, of the of the vertebral column you form these intervertebral foramen because remember a foramen is an opening within a bone okay now technically this isn't an opening inside of a bone this is an opening created by you know by how two bones are organized okay but remember foramens are openings or passageways you know that are associated we'll just say associated with bones that allow for the passageway of nerves and blood vessels okay nerves and blood vessels all right so remember vertebrae are not touching each other and you know what can happen sometimes is you've all probably heard of a herniated disc before okay with the herniated disc essentially um, excuse me you know with a herniated disc you know this is obviously a fairly serious scenario because you can see this is what a normal looking in, um, intervertebral disc look like this fibrocartilage and now if this disc herniates um, you know the nucleus pulposus of the disc you know the, the gelatinous inner you know the gelatinous nucleus or inside of the disc if that herniates to one side that could cause the foramen to get smaller and compress a nerve okay and then you know and now and then when you as we go and discuss this a little more you'll understand why people will have sensory deficits or sensory problems due to the compression in this area you know based on how sensory in, sensory information and motor output goes in and out of the spinal cord all right and then now bear in mind when we're talking about you know when we're talking about this regionally remember the spinal cord is going to be located within here okay and then this and then the nerves are going to be entering and exiting the foramen on the lateral aspects kind of just above the just above the lamina of the vertebrae okay and that's why some people may have to have a laminectomy to relieve pressure on a nerve okay where you go in and surgically excise a part of or this this part of the bone itself to relieve some pressure all right so all right, so kind of keep this image of the of the vertebrae because on the on the on the drawings that I made, I'm not going to include the vertebrae in there, but this is what you should be thinking about: that the spinal cord is going to be located within here. All right, and then the gray matter will be located within here. All right, and then the white matter will be all around. All right, and then the spinal and then the nerves will be entering and exiting through this same area through where the foramen are located. All right. So keep that in mind. And again, I'm not going to go over all the bony anatomy of this because, you know, by now, you should be very comfortable with understanding, you know, the, the anatomy of a vertebrae. If not, go back and review this because it is important you understand these basics of bony landmarks, okay? Because you have to remember when we're talking about, you know, when we're talking about this, we have to be in the proper orientation. When we're talking about the ventral versus the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord, okay? And remember that this is the body of the vertebrae 
and the body is always facing ventrally. Okay, meaning towards the belly or towards the front. All right, and then the spinous process is always facing dorsal. All right, now it's important that you understand or that you differentiate between ventral and dorsal when you're talking about the spinal cord because there's different, because input and output, you know, goes in one side and comes out the other. All right, so that's something you have to keep in mind. So like I said, go back and review the anatomy of the vertebrae if you're a little, you know, if, you're, if you've forgotten it or are uncomfortable with this. All right. So keep that in mind. Now, on that note, let's get talking about this. So let's say this would be the dorsal aspect. All right. And this would be the ventral aspect. Okay. So essentially, this would be the, the, the aspect of the spinal cord that's facing, you know, towards the front. And this would be the aspect of the spinal cord that's facing towards the back. Because remember, that's literally what dorsal means. All right. Now, what you see here, um, what, I'm gonna, what we're going to talk about first is just the, the gray and the white matter, and then we're going to talk about how the nerves are, or, are organized, okay? Now, in the spinal cord, you find gray matter centrally located within the spinal cord, all right? And um, so, this would be all the, so this would be all the gray matter in here. So remember that when we're talking about gray matter, okay, we're talking about that this is where nerve cell bodies are located. Whoops. This is where nerve cell bodies are located. All right, so remember that the gray matter is gray because, you know, when you take a bunch of, you know, these nerve cells have, fairly lar have a fairly large nucleus. All right, and remember, you guys have all seen what a nucleus looks like under a microscope. It's a very deep and black and dark in color. All right, so you have all of this. So when you have all these cell bodies, you know, kind of aggregating together like this, you will form a dark color in the tissue. Now, it's not going to be black because there are going to be some axons mixed in here from the interneurons, okay, and there may be some myelin on those, which will kind of lighten the color up a little bit, all right, so the presence of, so the presence of some axons within here won't make it completely black, it'll make it gray in color, all right, so, and then, and then all of this surrounding, okay, all of this in the periphery surrounding the spinal cord, okay, this would all be white matter, Okay, and it's white because, remember, the presence of myelin, and by now you should understand where myelin is located on a neuron. It's located on the axon of a neuron. All right, so essentially what you're looking at here, you're looking at when you're talking about the white matter, these are the essentially the pathways. Okay, and it's the same thing within the brain as well. When you're looking at white matter in the brain, those are neural pathways. So these are axons that are projecting, that are either ascending up towards the brain, and remember that would, those would be sensory pathways, okay, or we're talking about, you know, motor pathways descending down the spinal cord, all right? So that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about the white matter, okay? And then there are different aspects of the white matter that form different pathways going to and from the brain, all right? So the gray matter is essentially where input and output um, takes place and essentially where processing of information takes place and because remember that somatosensory pathways we talked about and then the white matter is essentially where we project for, you know from the axons up to the brain and back down from the brain to the spinal cord out to the body all right so that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about this now as we kind of move on let's take a look at how the how the the neurons are organized within here now, when we're taking a look at a spinal nerve, okay, so remember, this is where the foramen would be, okay, the intervertebral foramen would be here, and this is where the nerves would be exiting, all right. Now, what you have to keep in mind is that sensory, okay, sensory input always enters the spinal cord on the dorsal aspect, so, so, so information coming into the spinal cord is, you know, sensory input is always going to enter the dorsal aspect, okay? And remember, when we're talking about input, we're talking about neurons that are afferent, okay? Neurons that are projecting towards something, towards the spinal cord and the central nervous system, all right? And now, what, now what's different about this, so then obviously this would be, you know, this would be motor, Okay, this would be, you know, you know, this would be motor output, and motor output is always exiting on the ventral side. Okay, the ventral aspect. Now, 
there is there's going to be an area where both the set where both the sensory nerves and these motor nerves meet and this area where it happens we would call this a mixed nerve okay we would call that a mixed nerve okay so this is pure motor output this is pure sensory input but at at you know, right at about the level of the where the intervertebral foramen are located, these two nerves are going to come together and then exit this. You know, exit the vertebral column and then branch out from there to the appro You know, to the appropriate tissues that they're going to innervate. Okay, and again, I don't wasn't able to doodle all that for you, but you can. But you know, I'm I'm assuming you're looking at images and pictures of this as we're going along. Okay, so. Um, so that's something to think about. And then remember, within this gray matter, this is where the interneurons are going to be located, okay? The processing neurons. All right, remember, interneurons are like relay neurons, okay? So let's say you put your hand on the, let's say you put your hand on the table and, um, you know, then you've got this, you know, this, this, this sensory input coming in, you know, this is going to synapse with an interneuron and then it's, and then the axon of the interneuron is going to project up through the white matter towards the brain. Okay, now, if we come over here to this side and we, and we take a look at this, what we have here, the SS stands for somatosensory, and then the VS stands for visceral sensory. Okay, visceral sensory. All right, and then obviously down here, this would be visceral motor and somatic motor all right so as, so what we're saying here is um you know we got is we've got this 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 uh, neuron coming in now remember these nerves right here these are those pseudo bipolar um those pseudo bipolar neurons we're talking about because remember on the other end on the somatic end of this that this is where the sensory receptor is located you know like let's say in the skin or muscle all right and then they're gonna and then they're gonna synapse uh, you know, as they're coming in synapsing, then this, then this axon will project inward towards the spinal cord. So we got the receptor on this side and then the synaptic terminals on this end. Okay, and remember that, so basically as these somatosensory neurons enter the spinal cord on the dorsal aspect, they're going to synapse with inner neurons more towards the, you know, the, you know, towards the dorsal horn, um, you know, the very dorsal side of the dorsal horn. Okay, so this is what we would call dorsal horn. I mean, you take a look at this, this looks kind of like a horn. Okay, that's why they that's why they call it that. All right. So so remember when I say somatosensory, we're talking skin and muscles. Okay, so so neurons from skin and muscles are gonna synapse with the you know on the you know more towards the um, the proximal end of the dorsal horn, and then the, and then when we say visceral sensory, you know, we're talking, um, which you, which is represented in the green here. All right, we're talking that these are neurons that are coming in from actual organs and their connective tissue, you know, their associated connective tissue capsules. All right. And, um, they're going to synapse more in the door, in the, uh, um, distal aspect of the of the horn here, okay, the dorsal horn. So visceral sensory. Now, so then what? So then what's going to happen? You know, depending on the stimulus, okay, you know, depending on the stimulus, information is going to project either up to the brain or immediately back out. It depends essentially on which type of neurons are synapsing with the spinal cord and what type of stimulus is engaging these. Um, these what was I going to say? These uh, da, 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 these uh, these neurons. I'm sorry, these inner neurons and so on. Okay. Now, these visceral motor and somatic motor. Now, what's different about these is that notice where the cell bodies of these neurons are located. Okay. And when you're talking about these sensory neurons, there are these bulges on the out on the outer aspect of the spinal cord. Let's kind of jump back here for a second. And take a look. See, see how the spinal cord kind of bulges out right there. I know it's a little difficult to see. Actually, in this bottom picture, you can see it kind of well. Okay, that's what we would call a ganglion. Okay, that's what we would call a ganglion. Now, remember, I, I think I've talked about this before, but I'm going to bring it up again. A ganglion is a cluster of 
neuron cell bodies. Okay, is a cluster of neuron cell bodies. Okay, so remember you've got the so remember you've got the sensory, you've got the receptor side because remember these are those kind of pseudo bipolar neurons. Okay, so this is where the receptor would be located. Let's say this is out in the skin. All right, it's gonna you know it's gonna generate an action potential into this body, and then the axon from the body will project inward to the spinal cord. Okay, so that's why the that's why right here it bulges out because you've got all these cell bodies from sensory neurons located outside of the spinal cord itself. Okay, they're just barely outside of the spinal cord, and that's why it bulges right here. All right. Now, if we go back to this and we take a look at this image here, you'll notice that the, that the cell bodies of motor neurons, whether they're visceral motor or somatic motor, the cell bodies are located within the ventral horns of the spinal cord itself. Okay, so the cell bodies are located within the spinal cord itself. All right, and um, and that's why you know typically why these axons of these motor neurons are also very large and very myelinated as well, so we can get motor output out very quickly. All right, so the so the cell bodies of motor neurons are found within the spinal cord. The cell bodies of these sensory neurons are found just peripherally to the spinal cord. Okay, within those within those dorsals within those dorsal ganglion. Okay, within those dorsal ganglion. Okay, so remember, sensory input into the dorsal aspect, motor output out through the ventral aspect. And then where these two nerves meet, then we form a mixed nerve, a mixed neuron. Okay, not neuron, mixed nerve, I'm sorry. All right, and remember all this white matter here, and remember there's inner neurons located all over in here, and all these, all this white matter, remember, are, ascending path, are either ascending or descending pathways to and from the brain. I remember I brought up the word afferent before, okay, so, is, so remember motor output, this would be efferent. Okay, this would be efferent. Okay, remember output away, moving away from something, from a, from more away from a centralized structure. Excuse me. All right. So let's move on now to the withdrawal reflex. Okay, I want to move on to the withdrawal reflex. All right. Now let's, as we kind of take a look at this withdrawal reflex, and again, I'm not going to. Not half bad. Okay. Actually, that is pretty bad, but. Okay. So let's talk about the, the, the physiologic anatomy of withdrawal reflex. All right. Now. When we have to engage in a reflex, you know, there's different types of reflexes. There, there are visceral reflexes, you know, or, auto, or automatic or autonomic reflexes. There are more of those somatic motor reflexes. You know, when you hear the word reflex, I'm assuming what pops into your head is like when you go to the doctor and they pop your knee with a mallet and you... You know, you do the knee-jerk reflex, or you're cooking and you touch a hot object and you pop away because you because you touched the the stove or burned yourself, or you stepped on a nail and then had to jerk away. All right. So you know, and then you know, there are other types of reflexes as well that take place. Now, a couple of things, you know, like like these visceral reflexes, you know, like changes in blood pressure and heart rate and so on. Those are more regulated by the autonomic nervous system. And I'm going to talk about the autonomic nervous system in some lecture in some other lecture videos here pretty soon. Okay, but before I talk about reflexes, I want to talk a little bit of, just about some characteristics of reflexes. One, reflexes are stereotyped. Okay, when I say stereotyped, what I'm saying here is that they are very specific. Okay, they're very specific, and that has to do with the regional anatomy of the spinal cord. Okay, so let's say, for example, you step on a nail, okay, and all of a sudden you've got, you've got in, you know, this, this pain input coming in from your foot. It's going to enter a specific region of the spinal cord. It's going to synapse with specific neurons in that spinal cord, interneurons, and then, it, and then specific motor output from that region is going to exit as well. Okay, so due to the regional anatomy of how nerves enter and exit the spinal cord, and again, I'll do videos on this much later on, okay, um, you know, that, you know that, that adds to the specificity of a withdrawal of a, of a reflex. Another thing about reflexes is, is that they are un, 
they're unconscious, okay? Reflexes are unconscious. Now, this is something to think about. I know, you know, for some of you who are new to this type of material, uh, you know, learning about the human body, one thing that, you know, you know, this is something to think about is let's say you're cooking or let's say you're walking down the beach. I'll go with this example. Let's say you're walking down the beach and, um, heck, I used to live up in Superior, Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, you can build bonfires out on the beach. I don't know if you can anymore, but, um, and typically where there are bonfires late at night, there's beer drinking. All right. And let's say some people go out and, you know, throw a party and they're get a little rowdy and they're breaking glass all over the place. And let's say the next morning I go out, you know, let's say I go out to the beach and I want to go for a walk. Okay. So, or a run, you know, I used to like to run on the beach. So let's say I'm out going for a walk and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm walking barefoot because I'm figuring, you know, it's sand cool. And all of a sudden my foot steps on a piece of glass, you know, lands on a piece of glass that's buried in the sand. Okay. Now think about this. As my foot hits that piece of glass, Okay, and that piece of glass penetrates the skin of my foot. What would be a more, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Am I going to feel the pain and then withdraw my foot from that? Or am I going to feel the pain or, or am I going to withdraw first and then feel pain? Okay, something to kind of think about. Do we pull away before we feel pain or pull away after we feel pain? Okay. So these are unconscious automatic mechanisms and reflexes. Another thing you have to remember about reflexes is that they are very rapid. They are quick. Okay. And, you, and you'll learn about why they're quick here in a second. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind about these reflexes. Now let's kind of move on to another. Okay. Oops. Using different colors now. I'm going to mess you guys up. Okay. Now, when we're talking about reflexes, there are typically three neurons involved in a reflex. Okay. There are typically three neurons involved in a reflex. There's typically a, there's got to be a receptor. There is an interneuron. And there is a motor neuron. And also what's involved with this is an effector organ. Okay, an effector organ. All right. So let's talk about this. So I'm walking along the beach. I'm walking along. My foot hits that piece of glass. Now, what type of receptor am I going to stimulate? You know, is that, is that foot penetrates my, I'm sorry, as, my, as that glass penetrates my foot, what type of receptor is going to essentially be engaged or turned on or activated? What are, remember, remember, think about this, what are your pain receptors? Okay, remember that's going to be a nociceptor. Okay, because remember, nociceptors, the stimulus for nociceptors are extreme pressure, and extreme temperature, pardon my handwriting, I didn't give myself a lot of room. So extreme pressure and extreme temperature. So if I step on a piece of glass, that's going to be an example of extreme pressure. Okay, you know, the pressure of, you know, of that glass is going to sear and tear or shear and tear my skin, and that's going to cause damage. Okay, so you're not going to so the normal mechanoreceptors, they're out of the picture, okay, because this stimulus is strong enough to elicit a nociceptor, all right? So now that nociceptor is going to come in and synapse with an interneuron within the spinal cord here, all right? It's going to synapse with an interneuron within the spinal cord, all right? Now, that interneuron is going to, you know, as that interneuron is being turned on, okay, Oops. all right, you know, it's receiving neurotransmitter from a nociceptor, not a normal mechanoreceptor, okay, so essentially if this nociceptor is, 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 is communicating with these interneurons, it's, you know, it's releasing chemical messages about pain, okay, you know, so as we're processing this, uh, this is what we would call the circuit level, 
okay, you know, the circuit level within the central nervous system. All right, what's going to happen then is that, as, you know, as this nociceptor synapses with these specific inner neurons, okay, this inner neuron is going to generate an action potential directly to a motor neuron, okay, directly to a motor neuron. All right, and then what's going to happen is immediately you're going to start generating action potentials out that motor neuron, okay, out the motor neuron, and then that motor neuron, you know, you know what motor neurons innervate, motor neurons essentially, you know, innervate muscles for the most part, I mean, they obviously innervate more than that, you know, such as various glands, you know, within the body as well, but we're just going to think muscles in this situation. All right, so think about this. You've got the sensory neuron, okay, gen you know, there's this nociceptor generating essentially pain signals into, into the spinal cord. All right. Now, this inner neuron is synapsing with this motor neuron, and you're sending output out immediately. Okay. So remember, sensory input the dorsal side, motor output the ventral aspect of the spinal cord. All right. So then you can do the math on what's going to happen here. This motor neuron then is going to release acetylcholine, remember the neurotransmitter, to make a muscle contract. And then what are you going to do? You're going to withdraw. So what is the stimulus here? My foot going through a piece of glass. Okay, so I'm going to contract specific muscles, and I'm going to pull my foot out of that situation. Okay, I'm going to pull my foot out of that situation. Now, this is an automatic unconscious reflex. Okay, an automatic unconscious reflex. All right, now, at what point in time did I mention the brain in this? I didn't. Okay, so basically what we're saying here, I, you know, I, I posed the question in the previous slide, do you withdraw before you feel pain or after? Okay, you're going to withdraw after. I'm sorry, ah, God dang it. You're going to withdraw before, sorry, sorry, ignore what I just said. You're going to withdraw before you feel pain. Okay, due to, due to just how these circuits are set up. Okay, why is that advantageous? Think about why that would be advantageous. Okay, you know, why would you want these reflexes to be so fast and stereotyped and also, you know, you know, work before you perceive pain? You're going to minimize damage, okay? Even though, the, even though this, this information is going to get up to the brain, I mean, it, it, so quickly, I mean, faster than the blink of an eye, the faster you get yourself out of this, simu out of this situation, you know, out of putting your foot on that piece of glass and damaging your foot, the less damage, you know, you can minimize the damage. All right. So it's nice that we have these built-in mechanisms, you know, these uh, these uh, kind of somatic, these motor type reflexes. All right, because that's what they're designed to do: get us out of situations that are causing, you know, pain. Because remember, pain is a is a stimulus that causes harm to our tissues. All right, and then. You know, then essentially, you know, the, you know, other, you know, due to, you know, various other circuitry within the, within the spinal cord, you'll start generating, you know, action potentials up to the brain, you know, up to that somatosensory cortex, and then you'll start to feel pain. And then you'll start to say, wow, I should probably wear sandals or shoes next time I walk on the beach, especially, you know, on, you know, especially on a Saturday morning, you know, day after a Friday night. Okay, so these, so this is the real basics of how these motor, these these somatic motor type reflexes work. Okay, you've got a sense, you've got sensory input, a sensory neuron involved. Then you've got an inner neuron, and then you've got a motor neuron. Okay, and you can see how this basic circuitry works. And remember, when we say effector organ, we're talking about the or, you know, an organ, you know, because remember the whole point of this reflex, the whole point of these of these mechanisms are to get us out of this situation. So the organs we have to affect or elicit a response out of in this situation are our skeletal muscles, okay? And remember, regionally, you know, like I said, the reason why we can stereotype these, again, is because, you know, this information, you know, from the leg is going to come in and, you know, from the leg and the foot, are going to come in a certain region of the spinal cord, all right? And motor neurons that innervate that area, whether sensory or motor, are going to enter and exit that specific region of the spinal cord. So that's how we can specifically control this. You know, and that's why, for example, when you step on this, you know, my arm isn't going to sit there and unconsciously go dang, 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 and twitch. It's just your feet, you know, your legs are going to pull off of that, okay? And then you'll start to consciously feel the pain and say, wow, this really stinks.
guys will probably say more than that, but you get the picture. All right, so that's kind of a general overview of spinal nerves and how, the, how they work, and also a general overview of withdrawal reflexes. Um, so bear in mind, I mean, these very, you know, these very basic concepts that sensory, you know, that, that the cell bodies of these sensory neurons are located outside of the spinal cord. Okay, that sensory that you know, um, you know, afferent sensory input enters the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord, and that motor output exits the ventral aspect of the spinal cord. You know, so remember, all this processing takes place within the gray matter. Uh, you know, within these dorsal and ventral and you know horns of the of the uh, gray matter of the spinal cord, and then remember, all this white matter are ascending and descending sensory and motor pathways to and from the brain. Okay. You know, again, folks, if you have any questions about, about this topic or any of these concepts, you know, again, don't hesitate to email me and uh, good luck in your studies and keep working hard.